this is really a very brief introduction to Nextflow and just to give you a sense of uh, how we developed this tool, why we developed this tool and a kind of uh, high level take of the tool, and how it works and what makes it a little bit different from alternative tools. So because you signed up for this course, I guess all of you know that Nextflow is a pipeline language and a pipeline language means two things in this case, which is not necessarily the case of any language. It means it's about writing your pipelines and it's about running your pipelines. These are the two functionalities that Nextflow is going to support for you. That's very important because in a way, running your pipelines is just as important as writing them. It's not like when you write a computer program and then you run it on your computer. When you run a pipeline, usually you have um, dilemmas about processing 1 million samples in parallel or in serial and about throwing some parts of your computation on the cloud and then reproducing it on an HPC and all this kind of thing, the performance computer center. And it's not trivial. There's nothing trivial about this because this requires interactions with increasingly complicated layers of software, queue managers and the queuing systems and all these type of things. Nextflow will take care of parallelization or what some computer scientists call embarrassingly parallel computational problems. What is this? It's a problem where the parallelization is implicit. Uh, um, if I run a multiple alignment software, and if I want to do, or if I design a multiple aligner, and I want to do smart parallelization, I will have to go very deep and I will have to start editing the code, figuring out if I can do uh, a matrix this way or that way. This will be non-embarrassingly parallelization. What is embarrassingly parallel is a situation where you have thousands of samples that are all identical, and you want to process them all in parallel because they don't have to talk to one another to be properly processed. So that's typically the kind of parallelization Nextflow is going to take care of for you. And of course, it's a little bit down to your, uh, to your own design as to which level you want the parallelization to take care. I don't know, if you're managing samples from hospitals, you could treat every hospital as a unit of computation or you could go very low level and treat every patient as a unit of computation. That's whatever you want to do, but that's your decision. Another very important aspect is that Nextflow, only one E, supports containers, which means it contributes to reproducibility. And to this concept that many of you have probably heard of, which is a FAIR concept. FAIR is a contribution towards computational reproducibility. It is the idea that any uh, uh, in silico object has to be findable, means you have to have something like Google or the equivalent to find it. It has to be accessible. If you click on the link you get, you should not get a four or four. It has to be interoperable. All of these things have to be, have to be pluggable into one another and it has to be reproducible. And that's on the reproducibility side that Nextflow is making a contribution. Now, what makes Nextflow special? You know, it's, a, it's my baby. It's mostly Paolo Di Tommaso's baby, who was uh, the person who developed it in our lab, but it's also my baby. We, 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 share, <laughs> we share Nextflow. And so, of course, you think your tools are always very special. And which means that my words about this are, are, are just as, uh, as, uh, as unbiased as I can make them unbiased, but I'll try my best. So in Unix, and all of you are familiar with Unix, so more than others, but I guess all of you are familiar with this pipe symbol, you know? It's a very, very low level component of Unix. And that's something very important in Unix. In Unix, you can pipe data, meaning that if you have a process A, that is producing bits of data. And when I say bits of data, it's precise. In the case of pipe, it's going to be line by line. The line is going to be the unit of data. And on the other side, we have a process that is able to consume this data line by line. And the pipe is simply connecting these two processes. Now, behind the scenes, unknown to you, managed by Unix, something smart is happening. Something smart, meaning that this thing here is cut in chunks of one line and is passed one line at a time. 
And that process here that you wrote that has been written by somebody else knows how to consume the data line by line, okay? We do this all the time. Computer scientists actually hate us for doing this because uh, piping stuff in Unix is the opposite of high level computer science, although this very integrated thing they do in computer science. And if you look at uh, most of the papers, most of the things that are happening in bioinformatics, they are glued together by one liners. You know, the number of one liners used over the years in bioinformatics is amazing. And so, uh, uh, of course, there is so much you can do in terms of pipeline. And at some point, it becomes very difficult to debug pipes that are piped into pipes, into pipes, into pipes, and so on. But what is very powerful in this approach is that the thing that is here, B, does not need to know how much data it is going to have to process. It does not need to have an overview. And the thing that is here does not need to care about what is going to happen with its data. Data is simply flowing. And uh, uh, um, of course, if you wanted, you could be smart here. And when you receive the data, you could send it to many, many, many different instance, instances of B. And this is exactly what NextFlow is going to do for you. Now, the pipe is similar to something known as reactive programming by computer scientists. And the idea is that, you know, you have a program waiting and waiting and waiting, and then suddenly something arrives. If you, uh, we have had quite a lot of big waves in, uh, in Barcelona these last days, and there were people surfing. And when you look at the surfers, and I think, Julia, you were uh, in, 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 in California for a while. And so if you look at the surfers, they do nothing, really. They float in the water. And so they see a wave coming, and they get excited or not. And they wait and wait. And that's exactly how it works with NextFlow. You wait the processes, wait for no cost, if you do it in a smart way, until something arrives to be processed, something arrives to be consumed. Now, this way of defining computation is exactly the opposite of Makefile. Most of you are probably familiar with Makefile. When you install a package Unix, you have a configuration file. And this configuration file, the Make, tells about the dependencies between everything. For instance, if you have a .c file, it implies that in order to generate the executable, something has to be uh, um, applied so that you turn the .c, the, the code file, into a .or, an object file, all these dependencies. This is a dependency graph. When you type make with a make file, the first thing that happened is actually the computation of all the dependency before the work even starts, make file has to compute this graph. When it comes to compiling programs, this is amazing. This is unbeatable because you know that you have to, to, to know these dependencies. But when it comes to computation, it can be a pain because if you have a very large number of samples, if you have a very deep level of operation that are going to be applied on this, you may have a graph that is actually very dense, and you may have a graph that could take more space and more memory and more time to compute than the actual computation. And this is the reason why we decided not to go for a make file like way of processing data. We decided to go the other way around. We decided to go for a uh, um, for a uh, sorry for a reactive programming sorry a reactive programming uh, 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 way of doing this and that makes huge difference. We don't need to compute the graph, but it's harder for us to do a dry run, for instance, which is one of the things you know. The alternative to NextFlow was Snake Make, and Snake Make was really built initially on the top of Make File, and the idea was that you do your computation as you will do make file. This was a very good idea. At the time, very honestly, we didn't know about snake make. If we had known about snake make, we may have been using it. Eh? But we didn't know about snake make. And we knew that we did not want our tool to be built on make file for the very reason I've just explained, because we knew that we were going to have to do massive parallelized computation. OK, so difference. Next flow flows data make file prepares data. And that's really the main difference between these two approaches. In a small instance, it makes no difference at all. Then snake make 
is well implemented and every once in a while they figure out small heuristics so that you can scale up but you know as many people may have told you with snake make every once in a while you hit a wall because you've gone over what could be really uh, what could be really pre-computed in the case of nextflow you never hit this wall because by definition the computation is going to scale with your capacity the only snag with nextflow is that it's a little bit harder to run a dry run that the you know you know as they say in computer science th there's no such thing as a free lunch if you get a benefit from one side you lose it from the other side and but in practice there are many simple alternative to subsample your data for instance and to figure out if you can run some analysis on a smaller instance and all these type of things okay so this thing here is probably the first pipeline we implemented in nextflow that was in the lab there was something called unistrap it is something called unistrap it is uh, an, uh, uh, an extension of bootstrap that takes into account multiple sequence alignments and you can see here each of these things here is is a program and each of these things here is defined as a process. And what do you need to do? You need to wrap, this will be your script. And it's very important. Your script is written in any language you want. And we needed this because all the scripts already existed in the lab. We were not going to, we were not going to create new scripts from scratch for everything. We needed to be able to reuse everything. And if I were, uh, Paolo Di Tommaso hates it when I say this, but if I were to summarize Nextflow in a few words, I will say Nextflow is the equivalent of HTML to pipeline development. In HTML, you have something you want to see written on the screen, and then you wrap it around tags. And the tags are telling your screen, are telling the computer how this message is going to have to be displayed. And that's exactly how Nextflow works, except that rather than tagging this pipeline here, rather than tagging it with, uh, with uh, formatting, I'm tagging it with a description of its input and I'm tagging it with a description of its output. I know what the input comes from and I know where the input goes to or what type of output is going to be produced. And of course, it's for every process to know what they expect and what they receive. And when you have written this thing, implicitly you have a graph like this. This graph here is not produced by you. It is a consequence of the way your pipeline has been written in Nextflow language. Okay, this is what Nextflow does, but there is actually much more to this, and that has to do with reproducibility. At the time Nextflow came out, uh, this was not our intention was not to make a contribution on reproducibility. To be honest, our intention was to have a simple, effective system to run our pipelines in the lab. But it turned out everybody was noticing that there was a major issue with reproducibility in modern research, the impossibility to reproduce exactly published results. And very few people knew it, but there was also a reproducible issue in, uh, in computational biology. And actually we stumbled on this in Nextflow, which is one of the reason, not the only one, but one of the reason we made it in Nature Biotech actually, because that aspect is something that was even more important than the easiness with which one can compute uh, pipelines. And it's actually uh, uh, Evan Floton, one of the co-authors of the Nature Biotech paper, who came out with this observation that if you take your pipeline, you run it on two different computers with exactly the same software version, exactly the same data, everything you can control for is identical. And you will still get more often than not slight differences. For instance, here this is uh, this is uh, the main uh, uh, illustration of um, of uh, of in the next flow in the Nature Biotech paper. It's just finding differentially expressed genes using Callisto. Well, everything being equal on Amazon Linux or on Mat OS six native, two Linux flavor. There should not be any difference. You find roughly the same thing but you're gonna find 74 genes that appear to be differentially expressed on your Amazon box and 64 that only pop up on the Mac. Why is that? I have no idea. And trying to investigate it will be a waste of time because if you think of these machines, if you think of these computers as machines, and if you think of every line of code as a moving part, you are talking about 
billions of moving parts. And there's no way to figure out which library is slightly ahead or slightly behind or slightly bugged. And in fact, the 64 and the 74 here, they are neglectable from a biological point of view. But from an operational point of view, they are essential because you have to be you have to be able to reproduce exactly your computation. If only because six months, one year after debugging, uh, publishing, uh, or sending a paper for review, you have to redo exactly or to debug something. Or if only because these will be patient samples and you want to make sure that you get exactly the same readouts, regardless of the hospital in which this is going to be produced. Okay. So, uh, before we knew it, people started doing amazingly complicated things with Nextflow. This is uh, the companion pipeline done by the singer. And just when we were writing the paper, we saw that this monster had come out of nowhere. And I think it bundled something like 30, more than 30 different software components. And that came out as a major strength of uh, Nextflow. It's a great way to bundle all your software. And one thing I forgot to say about the last slide, how did we solve this problem? We solved it or we addressed it because of containerization. Docker and all these kind of things were the solution to this problem. If you containerize all of your software, you, you, you have no way to know if this is correct or this is correct. But what you can do with the dockerization is that everything is going to be the same regardless of the platform on which you're running. And that's why it's so relevant, for instance, for medical computation. And as I was saying a, few, uh, a second ago, it's great because you can bundle so many tools together and it becomes a no brainer to move them from one uh, platform to another platform on the cloud, regardless of the flavor of Linux that are going to be used on your cloud, regardless of anything you have to do. Now. Uh, the funny thing is that when we were doing this, we figured out that it's not only uh, gene uh, prediction, it's not only gene expression. We also found these fluctuations, these very clear fluctuations in uh, in uh, in phylogenetic reconstruction. And it seems to me, you know, this seems to be the part of the numbers you shouldn't care so much about because this is really, really, really in the low digits. But no, if you are dealing with a tree that features millions of leaves, as we are going to do now, these things eventually induce topological variations as well. So that's something real that is happening here. And, and uh, again, this instability is not the consequence of uh, random seeds, stochastic, uh, genuinely stochastic process. No, it is a result, you know, everything being deterministic, uh, why it's typically the, the culprit are typically slight differences in rounding actually this is really usually the main culprit in these things and this rounding rounding is an art in computer science and as it happens it varies a little bit from uh, from one flavor to the other so what are the secrets docker really the fact that everything is registered with it should be heavy dependence on github heavy dependence on Zenodoo as well, integrating the data sets in Zenodoo, meaning that if you have a pipeline that has been published and if the pipeline has been properly registered at the right place, all you need to do is to run one liner on your machine and you're going to be able to run or to rerun exactly the same uh, pipeline that has been used to generate a paper, that, that, that has been used to generate results on a paper, okay? Um, of course, it, uh, it, uh, it, it is very nicely integrated with all of these things. And, and this is something that is going to be explored much deeper during the course. So I don't spend much time explaining this to you. But the idea is that you, you can run any language. You know, your pipeline can be written in any language you have. Uh, your pipeline can be containerized with whatever you like. Singularity, Docker, as you know, Docker, System managers usually don't like it too much because of some security issue. Singularity is more popular and all these kind of things. You get all the main platform that are supported and that's very important as well. Oops, okay. So for a long time, Nextflow was, the problem of Nextflow is that it was non-modular. Each time you needed to, uh, uh, to, to bundle two pipeline, you would have to rip them open and to do a lot of cut and paste. And that's really not what you want to do. And so Paolo spent quite a lot of time shifting to DSL2, domain specific language 
two, which is the current version of NextFlow, which is modular. It means that whenever you write a pipeline, you can easily combine it with an existing pipeline without having to do any cut and paste or anything that will be invasive. Okay, so that, that is something that um, it seems to be taken from granted that everything is going to be modular. But when it comes to this uh, to this pipelining, it is not something trivial, and that took a bit of work. But I understand this is having a lot of success. Now, uh, uh, um, uh, um, comparisons, you know, never trust any benchmark done by the authors themselves. That, that, that's the rule, that, that's my rule in multiple sequence alignments and all these kind of things. This is why I'm always so happy when I see nice comparative analysis done by others and us. And this one just came out in Nature Method and it shows, so, it shows something very nice. You know, you get, you get all of these things here, ease of use, which is always a bit arbitrary, expressiveness. So I had to look it up on uh, Google, on, on Wikipedia, because I was not too sure. And expressiveness means basically you're going to be able to express any quantitative concept you want to express with your language. Both ability, scalability, learning resource, pipeline initiatives. So here near the top, you have Galaxy. Galaxy is a big monster. But bear in mind that Galaxy was not built around containerization. It was not built around HPC. It was built to be useful for users. And what is nice about this list of popular tools is that they all occupy their own corner. You're not going to see any of these tools that would have three stars in all the columns, which is telling you that you, as a biologist, your job is not so much to be able to use a tool. Your job is also to figure out which tool is going to best fit your need or your users. For instance, Galaxy is great because you just draw around boxes and before you know it, you have something that is working. But you know what you can do in Galaxy remains limited and that's a natural trade-off. It's easy to use, but you can do what you can do. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have all these next flow stake make, which are, which are kind of the same here. They are not, they are a bit less easy to use. You have to learn some stuff, but their expressiveness is infinite. You can do absolutely anything you want with these things. And, uh, uh, um, and, and the portability, and so I'm arguing here, but I'm sure snake make people will have a counter argument that, that next flow is a little bit more portable. And these people actually agreed with this. Now, uh, 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 um, this being said, you know, to be honest, in, in, in consortiums where I am, and, and you know, I'm telling people don't, if, you, if you've gone snake make, it's fine. And the, 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 there won't be any massive difference. If you don't have the resources, do not try to go from snake make to next flow. But if you start from scratch, of course, I think next flow is, is a better starting point. Um, so uh, it's uh, it's always interesting to, uh, to 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 ponder what made a project successful because Nextflow has been successful well beyond their expectations and uh, uh, very often I see projects failing on the long run because people do not really understand what was a critical point that made them so successful and so I've been trying to think about this and behind the success of Nextflow we had the urgency it was easy to use for urgent problems in a small lab meaning we were working for ourselves and that makes a huge difference. That makes it a grassroots project. It was really made by users, for users, or the other way around. It was simpler than complicated alternative. We first tried to do CWL like everybody and this was undoable. And especially, and that's one of the things that worked very well with us, Paolo was amazingly effective at engaging the members of the lab. As I told you before, Evan, who figured out about non-reproducibility was not working on Nextflow. It is just something that came later. Very rapidly, we built a user community. And if you're new to Nextflow, you're going to figure out that the main pair of working with Nextflow is that you get all these very active exchanges on forum. Whatever question you have, you will very rapidly have an answer. And that's really one of the perks of working with a very active project. Now, the big surprise, the, the, the nicest surprise we had uh, um, amid something very, very sad. I mean, the COVID-19, the big surprise we had was to figure out that a very large fraction of COVID data actually went through Nextflow powered pipeline. We never had this in mind when we started Nextflow. And people did this because Nextflow was an easy solution. You know, that's the real reason that decides on these things to happen. The ease of implementing very large pipelines 
and developing them, you know, implementing the pipeline, not knowing where it is going to be run, is something very tricky. Nextflow makes it relatively simple. And that's one of the reasons behind this success. Uh, uh, another aspect that I think is essential is readability. Uh, uh, why do we need readability? Because uh, all of these medical pipelines, they will soon decide about our lives. And, you know, we've seen it with, um, we've seen it with the COVID. Uh, fake news are amazingly popular. And if you, let's put, let, let's think of a very sad situation where you're sick, you have a cancer maybe, and your data is passed through a pipeline. And the pipeline is going to come out with a magic number, say 19.5. And your medic is going to tell you, ah, oh, yeah, there is a new drug, you know, this wonderful drug you've heard about. But for this, you need to have a genetic score of what it may be of 20. At 19.5, you're not eligible for this treatment. And that's very, you know, that's not only you're sick, but you know you're going to get the, the treatment that makes people losing their hair you know, that make you sick and, and that feels like a double pain and now a double punishment and now if you do not trust the pipeline because the pipeline is so complicated then you are going to mistrust the whole system and we are back into the fake news world where you're going to see headlines running they are trying to control us with their pipeline or whatever and against this, there is only one answer. And the answer is to make sure that the pipelines are readable, that the algorithms deciding on our lives are readable. And how do you achieve this? You're not going to make pipelines, pipelines that are going to be readable by everybody, by, by, by your grandmother. But if your pipelines are well readable, they will be readable by a large number of people. And among these people, there will be a large number of people you trust. And if the people you trust can look at the pipeline and say, yes, this is a fair pipeline. This is a pipeline that is using state-of-the-art knowledge to take the right decision. Then you as a citizen, you're going to trust the output of these pipelines. And if the pipeline has the output that unfortunately you're not eligible for the very expensive treatment that works on the others, you will accept that this is part of life. And that's why I insist that we need readability. Uh, you know, think of fake news. You know, fake news, I like this. If they were alleles, they will be the fittest by far. And that's the problem we have with fake news. They're amazingly fit. And our only protection against this fake news is full transparency. And I'm arguing here that the level of transparency in next flow or in this kind of languages is part of this thing. And it's very important I'm telling you this because you guys are all soon going to write your own pipelines. And you know, biology, molecular biology, all of these things, it used not to matter so much because this was research. But now suddenly you're in a situation where this one liner you have in your pipeline, say, you know, superior to five or superior or equal to five. Well, maybe it's 100,000 people who stop being eligible for the treatment or who become eligible for the treatment. This just tiny one liner. And it's your responsibility to make sure that all of these things are written in such a way that they are transparent and trustable, okay? So uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. I apologize, Jose, I'm taking three minutes more. Jose, who is talking just after me, is going to tell you about another development of uh, around NextFlow, which is NFCore. So uh, uh, um, if, uh, if NextFlow was uh, a drug, a new drug, uh, uh, NFCore will be the pill in which this drug is being distributed. It's a very important development. NFCore is both a collection of high quality pipelines and it is a standard under which Nextflow pipeline can be written. Uh, you don't have to use NFCore to write your Nextflow pipeline. In fact, if it's a toy pipeline, maybe it's not worth the effort. But if it's a pipeline that you want at some point to see published and to see becoming public, then I really recommend you take a look at NFCore. It is something that is going to have a lot of influence. And uh, Jose is going to say a bit more about this. So I'm not spending too much time here. It's, uh, it's a very nice, powerful resource that comes along with a lot of powerful tools to write uh, increasingly standardized pipelines. That's very important. And it has a, a fast growing community. It's quite amazing. Uh, um, 
we are, we are encouraging all of our partners in Bovreg and Fang to use all of these pipelines and to use all of these languages. And uh, I'm, uh, 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 I have to finish, you know, giving credit where it's due. These two guys here, Paolo. Paolo is really the mastermind behind the uh, next flow. He wrote, uh, he wrote this language. Most 95% of the code has been written in his own hand in the original one. And it's really, he really had uh, a very strong vision for this. Uh, Evan here is, uh, uh, was a former PhD student of mine and he's the one who figured out this issue about reproducibility. And it is something, it is something that is important and that gave a lot of visibility to Nextflow and helped a lot uh, reaching the success it has. And Maria Hatsu here was also a PhD student and was also an early adopter of Nextflow. And all these people thought this was time to go to the industry. To my, to my, I, I will not say I'm desperate, but you know, it's, uh, it's something that people my generation have to accept that your brightest students now do not necessarily stay in academia. Some of the brightest also go into industry, which is something relatively new. It's a new phenomenon and, and, uh, and it's interesting. It's an interesting development. And so uh, uh, um, all of these things uh, uh, that, that are used by a lot of people. And what is next? And I'll finish here. So Jose is working actively on something we call an edit benchmark, which will be a way, you know, all of this pipeline, they bundle together all of these tools that have been published and you know they do well on some data sets. You have some benchmarks of some data sets, but will they do equally well on your data set? If you were designing your own benchmarks, will they work? We want to make sure that when you have a bundled pipeline, you can quantify automatically the accuracy of this pipeline at any given time, given any existing reference data sets. Uh, um, this would allow, for instance, automated tuning, which is something that will be very desirable. Um, as uh, as uh, Diana mentioned it earlier, I uh, uh, run the NAR Genomics and Bioinformatics uh, Journal. We started this journal three years ago now. It's a, it's a relatively young title. We've just started being indexed in, uh, in PubMed. NARGAB is a sister title of uh, nucleic acid research. It is something... Uh, Nucleic acid research realized that they have too much in silico and bioinformatics, and so they had to do something, and so they created NARGAB. And I'm just about to start a section that will be dedicated to pipeline, a section where pipelines that are not necessarily scientifically innovative, but bundle together essential resources so as to become themselves essential resources, that these pipelines can be published and can be referred to as uh, as, as scientific resources. That, that's really what, uh, what we are trying to do here. And of course, it has a long, um, it has a strong connection with Code Ocean, which is a new way. It is something that is slowly being rolled in many journals where your paper will be published, not as a static paper as it used to be, but more as a, uh, a lab, um, uh, um, a lab workbook like Jupyter, Jupyter notebook and all these kind of things. So that the graphs, the data, the underlying computation are all bundled. And so I want to thank everybody who took place in, uh, took part in Nextflow, especially Evan and Paolo and Maria and, and, and Jose, of course, who is now going to take the floor over and going to, to talk about uh, some more uh, specific aspects of Nextflow. Okay. So yes, uh, I'm Jose Espinosa Carrasco and I work in the group of Sergio Notedab the developing pipelines, as I have been nicely introduced by, by Diane and, and also Sergi Carri uh, introduced very nicely Nextflow and NF Core. So I think I can jump directly to, to the presentation. Uh, what, what happened now? Okay. So yes, so what, what makes Nextflow Stone? This is something that Sergi has a little bit discussed, no? And, and I think that it's totally true that probably one of the things that made Nextflow very strong from the beginning is, is that it had a very enthusiastic and active community behind it. And you might think that this is not so important, but if you think about it, it's not just about numbers, having users and so on, but the most relevant point is that a strong community drives the innovation process. And, and yes, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Nextflow probably is one of the world for managers that support more environments, container engines, uh, Etc. No, and it's also one of the most popular. So yes, I, I would say that this is one of the main reasons of its success. 
Uh, and of course, Paolo and, and, well, and yes, Evan and, and all the people that has been in XO have worked very hard. But I think that without such a so dynamic community, uh, Nextro probably wouldn't have been so successful. Uh, I guess, and also Cedric uh, mentioned during his presentation, uh, it, no, so NFCore, NFCore it's, of course, it's not, not all the people that use Nextro are involved, involved in NFCore and so on, but uh, NFCore was created in, in early 2018. And, and now I will introduce a little bit about this, this more, more in-depth uh, NF core community. Okay, so these are, so as we are talking about community, uh, here I, I just put some, some numbers for you to, to see. So these are, for instance, the number of, of Slack users over time, and, and it's quite striking. So when I was preparing the presentation, I was looking at a, at a presentation that was like, less than a year before and it has increased like tenfold or something like this so it's really impressive then if you look for instance and um, which are the number of uh, github uh, nf core repository members or yes so this is how it has evolved uh, a long time so it's really that these things uh, i think that now are a little bit spreading uh, and there are like uh, 300 almost almost 4 400 uh, people that it's involved in the NFCO organization. Uh, then here I'm showing, I, I, I went back. So how many contributors or how many people contributed uh, to NFCO a long time? So this is, as I said, uh, NFCO started at early 2018. And you can see how many people have uh, contributed as committers or also uh, doing uh, either issues or, or commits to the to the repositories. And finally, here is something that uh, I think it's also very interesting. So when you, for instance, open a pull request in, in, a, in any of the repositories of NFCore, you can see how normally uh, people uh, mm, respond very, very fast. Also, it's the same for the issues. Of course, there are some issues that are more <laughs> stale in time, but I would say that uh, this actually reflects how dynamic this community is because there is always people, uh, yes, uh, in this case for issues and pull requests, but also in Slack, if you have any questions, you, you, you go there and there is always someone asking. So yes, just to, to finish this part about the NFCOR community, I just, I'm showing here some interesting links in case, uh, I, I guess that we will circulate the presentation. So in case you are interested, for instance, in joining Slack or uh, go to the to the NFCore uh, website. Also, uh, I would recommend you that take a look on the on the YouTube channel because well, now, for instance, there is a, a, each Tuesday at one o'clock there is a fifteen minutes talk about uh, it could be next row. Normally, it's more uh, NFCore related stuff. So, for instance, the, I took this one because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, the 24, because there have been already a lot of them. So how do I start writing my own DSL pipeline? And they are 15 minutes, so you can just go there and see uh, what's, what's going on. And if you're interested, they are also on YouTube. Okay, so as Cedric was mentioned, no? uh, what is NFCore? No? NFCore, it's a community, as I have already introduced. And this community, what it wanted to do, it's to, to have a curated set of analysis pipeline, pipeline, pipeline sorry, a build using Nextflow. No, so this lead to have a, a series of, of that line, a guidelines to to implement these pipelines. So it's kind of becoming, let's say, a, a standard of of how you uh, can do uh, pipelines following best practices in in terms of computational reproduci reproducibility, interoperability, and and portability, and what is also very interesting is that they have uh, they have developed uh, uh, some helper helper tools that can uh, be used either by users, but uh, also for for developers that want to get involved in 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 implemented uh, pipelines. Or if not, it shouldn't be only in the NFCore uh, ecosystem. You can also use them for in, for implementing your own pipelines. So yes, 
Here I'm showing, uh, so if you go to the NF Corp uh, website and you click in pipelines, you will get this, this list. Well, now you, as you can see, it's just, uh, I, I, I filter them by popularity. So, and you can see here that uh, these pipelines can per perform uh, most of the common omics analysis. Uh, and you have here a pipeline, for instance, for NASIG, which is, let's say, the, the flagship pipeline of, of NF Core, the one that gets normally the first, the, the new implementations or the new things that are, for instance, it's, it, this was one of the first, I think it, it was the first to be implemented in DSL2. And then you have this one for maybe some of you are, are familiar with them. So for, for calling germline or somatic variant, chip seek, attack seek. And what it's more interesting is that more and more now there are also, because um, at the beginning it was mostly genomic stuff, but now more and more uh, there are um, proteomics pipelines that, that are being developed or image pipelines and so on. So the list of pipelines that have been released is well, there are already 33 release pipelines. Uh, a pipeline is released when it has already been validated and it follows uh, the NF Core uh, standard, let's say, and, and it's in production. But there are also other 15 under development. This doesn't mean that they cannot be used, but maybe they are going to change by one day to the other because they are being actively uh, developed and there is no any official release yet. And then uh, there are five archives that maybe they are not maintained anymore, but uh, for, for traceability and in case someone uh, under producibility, they are archived and they are available as well. Okay, as I've said, so NF Core established a, a set of guidelines as here you can see uh, which are requirements here in green at the top and which are recommendations. So the first <laughs> requirement is that they should be built using Nextflow. <laughs> That's <laughs> very <laughs> normal, no? Then uh, they should have a MIT license. Then this is uh, maybe more, more interesting, no? Is that they should, uh, the software that these pipelines use should be bundled using Docker or Singularity. Uh, and this is because uh, this will uh, actually, um, so yes, this will enable that these pipelines uh, are, the, the results of these pipelines, analysis that these pipelines perform are reproducible. So you will, well, we will discuss about containers uh, uh, during the, the course. So just yes, for those that maybe are not familiar with them, what uh, uh, containers uh, allow to do is that uh, you can uh, sandbox your software inside this container. And you, this way you know that you are running a given version of a tool with uh, all the libraries and everything, and this is immutable. So meaning that each time you run uh, a given tool, you will get the, exactly the same results and you don't depend on, on the operating system or the libraries that you have installed and so on. Uh, then uh, they have to, to be, uh, so they have to have CI testing. So this, and they should include a minimal test data set for, for this end. So what this means is that uh, uh, you, so it's a good practice always to have a small data set along with your pipeline that allows to run you, to run the pipeline uh, time to, to just to, to like run all the steps that are uh, important in your pipeline so that in case you modify something and, and you spoil it, you, you know that, that this is happening and you can uh, solve it. Uh, then they also have to pass NF core link test. These are more, well, yes, some, yes, also some standards on, on how to write uh, the code, some files that are mandatory, as for instance, the, the JSON schema that it's that allows, for instance, to run the pipeline using a form, as I will show you in, in my presentation below. Uh, they also have to, to have a stable release tags. So, as you have seen, we, there are already 33 stable. Uh, pipelines and all of them uh, have been released uh, in GitHub and they also uh, should get a, a DOI using Zenodo so that they you can use any of these versions uh, and you know uh, which version you are using and you can run it back uh, in case you need to, to reproduce your results and so on. Then 
Uh, they also share a, a, a common structure and, and usage so that once you learn to use one pipeline, it's easy to run another pipeline because they have the, the same structure and, the, and you can use similar commands uh, to run it. They should, uh, it should be possible to run the, the whole pipeline in a single command. Also, they, have to, they, they should have comprehensive documentation, which is something that people uh, sometimes forgot, but uh, I think it's a, a very important point because sometimes you find very nice piece of software, but it's very difficult to, to run them because you don't know where to go to, to, to know how it works. And also a responsible point of contact. So a person like, let's say that it's the main maintainer of the of the pipeline, or, or yes, you can add this to, to if you have questions and so on. And then you have here some uh, recommendations so that the software, if possible, should be bundled with Bioconda. And this is now with Monda, uh, with modules uh, quite uh, important because and also it's quite a step forward because uh, most of the of the tools using bioinformatics have. Uh, a, a container in, in, in uh, well, yes, I, I'm now mixing things. Uh, I, I was mixing bio containers with Bioconda, but yes, what I wanted to say is that in bio containers, you get, uh, when uh, you can find uh, a software, uh, a, contain, a Docker container, a singular container, and a Conda environment for a given tool. And this, that's what mo uh, models are currently used. Uh, they also should explicitly support cloud environment, uh, benchmark from running on cloud environments, and an optimized output file formats, meaning that they, when possible, they should uh, run standard. So they should, uh, uh, the result should be in a standard file formats like CLAM or BAM, or but not use like strange file formats. Okay. Well, everything is in this paper. So if you want to, uh, to read it further, you can, you can take a look on it. So they, they they keep changing, and maybe you are now wondering why uh, why having these uh, strict uh, guidelines. So one of the reasons it's to follow fair principles, which is uh, that uh, this was uh, described for, for data, but it's also true for pipelines, so that the pipelines are findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and yes, and also because so NF Core it's built on top of of Nextflow, and Nextflow it's a very powerful, flexible tool that, as Sergey says, uh, enables you you to do a, a, any cool stuff. But uh, NF Core is like a little bit like you can do whatever you want, but you want uh, if you want to adhere to NF Core, you should to fulfill a set of guidelines, and you should do it in in a given in a given way. And, and yes, and the reason to, for having these uh, strict guidelines is, as I say, to, to follow for principles, also to adhere to the current best practices in terms of computational reproducibility and interoperability. So all NF Core pipelines allows you to perform reproducible analysis and in an interoperable manner, manner. Also, this guarantees the portability between different computational infrastructures, so you can run the pipeline in local, for instance, with the test data set, which it's small, but then you can go to, to, to the cloud and run it or to your server and also run it. Uh, and yes, and as uh, uh, they also, uh, so to have this common structure, enable a set of common features between pipelines. So this uh, makes that uh, all the pipelines uh, can be run in a similar way, and also that you know where you find uh, where you should put the documentation or where you should find the documentation. Uh, as well, I will show some an example here of, for instance, uh, what I was saying. No, that pipelines work in a comparable manner. So any of these commands uh, will run an NF Core pipeline. Uh, any of the NF Core pipelines. So here, what I'm doing is just uh, launching uh, the pipeline, and then I'm uh, this probably during the course will be well, sure will will be discussed. So I'm using a test profile and a singularity profile. So in this case, I will run it with the test data set and using sing the singularity containers. While in this case, I can do the same with Docker and with Conda, and you know that all the pipelines allow uh, the, same, the same command. 
well, this is uh, a toy example, but it's too. Also, another thing that uh, enables the, this common structure is that uh, all of them, of the all of the NF core pipelines, have a, a JSON schema, and this JSON schema describes the inputs and outputs and parameters of a pipeline. So using this JSON schema, if you go to the NF core pipeline, you can launch any of the pipelines using the, the web uh, interface. So as you can see here, I just put a, a simple example of a part. So here, this parameter will be to set the results folder. Here will be to set which reference genome you want to use. Here will be for uh, which email you want to, to get the results or if the pipeline is failing, and that tells you that it's failing. And all the pipelines allow this, and just uh, you can go to the website and you launch it as, as you can see here. This is when you press the launch. So then you can use uh, NF Core tools to, to launch it uh, really, or you can go to Nextflow Tower, which I will introduce later, uh, or simply take the command that it's regulated by, by the form and run it in local or in your cluster or whatever. Okay, so also as uh, I said uh, before, NF Core uh, provides with a set or a package of helpful tools. This is a, a Python package, it's not a Groovy package. <laughs> so this is something that people are always surprised, but uh, this uh, package, well, you, you can use both as a user of the pipelines or as a developer. Uh, and here uh, in this slide, you can see how you can download it from different resources. So from uh, the Python package index, from Bioconda, or how to, to obtain the, the Docker container with, with the tools. Uh, yes, as uh, I just said, uh, you can use both as a, as a user. So here I, I listed the, the commands that uh, for users, so list, list the, the variable NF Core pipelines, launch is to launch a pipeline uh, to the terminal, Download it in case you want to download the pipeline and all the containers that it use. For instance, imagine that you are uh, in an environment that you have no uh, internet access, so you can download everything and then you can just put it there and run the pipeline. And, well, and the license, this is just to see the, the license of a given pipeline. And this is more for developers. So you have create, which is to, uh, to for creating a pipeline. To lean, as I say, this was a requirement. So you can lean your pipeline and see whether it adheres to, to these linting uh, guidelines of NF Core. Then this one will be uh, maybe not only for, for developers, but also for users. Well, or maybe I would say more for developers, but not only if you want to develop an NF Core pipeline, I think it could be quite interesting if you are developing DSL2 pipelines because there are already, as I will show, a lot of models implemented uh, in NF Core, many tools that are implemented in NF Core as, as uh, DSL2 models. And then yes, these are yes, other, other uh, options for developers. So for, for the schema that I was mentioning before to bam a new version or to synchronize with the template because uh, well, just Mm, well, maybe I, I can discuss it uh, uh, when I discuss NF Core build. So here you have a NF Core list, uh, one of the of these commands. And as you can see here, what you can do is that you can list all NF, available NF Core pipelines. It also tells you whether it's in your system or not, and how much time uh, you you download it last time, and if you have the latest release, uh, which. Uh, it's sometimes a, a good idea no? if, because normally they implement new, new stuff, which is interesting. Then uh, you have NF Core launch. So in this case, I'm showing, uh, I was running this for, for the presentation and I'm just, yes, normally I, I don't use NF Core to launch pipeline, but I, I don't know, maybe some people it's interesting. So uh, I was doing it for the presentation and you can see it's similar to the form that I show you uh, through the website, but in this case it's in your terminal. And, and you can then uh, fulfill all the parameters and all the options and, and run the pipeline. So it's also maybe nice at the beginning when you are starting that, so that it guides you and then you get the, the command and then you can start playing uh, on your own. And then this is uh, more for developers because maybe you are not interested in developing an NF or to contribute to NF Core, 
but you you are going to 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 implement a quite big pipeline and you think that it will be interesting to to use the same standard so this uh, common allows you to to create a, a pipeline uh, so here is the whole tree that uh, in this case i create nf core toy for the presentation but this, this is the whole tree with all the files and as i was afraid that you cannot see it i just put it here only the parental directories and, and files but of course if you are not maybe uh, contributing to an F core, you are not interested on, on some parts. You can just delete it and take what whatever it's it's useful for for you. Okay, and as uh, Cedric was mentioning before, uh, Nextflow uh, it's turning modular or has turned modular actually. So it has uh, DSL two has been released in in July two thousand and twenty. So uh, so it's yes like. Uh, not uh, uh, not very long time ago, uh, and what DSL2 uh, does is that it enable, enables the definition of reusable modules and sub workflows. So because before uh, DSL2 appeared, what you had always is like you have a very big script that it was uh, like you have to put everything sequentially one uh, one process after the other. And now what you can do is that you can have yeah, like your small sub workflows that perform a given task. Uh, with uh, the modules and so on, and you can then plug them, I don't know, uh, a given process that uh, will be repetitive between pipelines like uh, uh, quality control of um, FastQ files, for instance. So you have your, sm your small sub workflow that uh, you implemented and you can use it uh, 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 between different pipelines. Uh, uh, yes, this is what it said here, and yes, some it has some. I don't know if any of you has already used Nextflow DSL one, uh, but it has small changes. So, for instance, channels can now be reused without need of create multiple copies of the same channel, and there is other the way you declare inputs and output channels are a little bit different, but it doesn't change the core Nextflow concepts. And yes, just to be to you to be aware that DSL one, uh, it's going to be in principle, it's going to be duplicated in in the future. And yes, I wanted to to introduce here uh, some DSL concepts that I have already mentioned during the presentation. Uh, so maybe not everybody will be agree on how uh, how uh, these concepts are defined, but I think it's nice to have like this kind of of separation. So a module could be a process that can be used within different pipelines and it's uh, as atomic as, uh, as possible. So it means that it cannot be split in another module. And an example will be uh, a module file containing the process definition for a single tool such as FastQC. Then we'll have sub workflows, which will be a change of multiple modules that offer a higher level functionality within the context of a pipeline. And this is like what I was saying before, or here in this case, this will be it could be a sub workflow to sort, index, and run some statistics on a on a BAM file that, that then you can use in, uh, in several of your pipelines. And a workflow will be an end to end pipeline created by a combination of next next for DSL two individual modules and and sub workflows and and this is a whole pipeline from one or more inputs to a series of final uh, outputs, it should be outputs or, or results. Okay. So yes, and so uh, Nextflow uh, uh, has become, well, has launched DSL2 and also NFCore it's becoming DSL2. Here I just wanted to show you that uh, some of the NFCore pipelines as a are already implemented as DSL pipelines. There are others that are being uh, moving right now. So for instance, the ChipSeq or the Ataxic pipeline, so all the smaller Ataxic pipeline are, are being ported. And the idea is that all the pipelines become soon, uh, all are implemented in, in DSL2. And this also, so what it makes is that uh, there are, a lot of modules, a lot of bioinformatic tools that are already implemented as NF core modules because they, they, there was a need to have these modules implemented for the pipelines. Uh, there are already 300 
29 modules available. And I think that this also could be interesting as a template, for instance, if you want to implement your own modules or even if you want to reuse the ones of NF Core. Uh, so you, NF Core tools also allow you, allows you to, to list them, to install them, also to create your own. You, there is like a template. So you, it's NF Core modules create and you can create your, your own. Uh, and the idea is that uh, this repository also in the future will host sub workflows. For the moment, there are only four prototypes, but this is work in progress. And I think that soon there will be, will be more. And yes, uh, this is as, as Cedric uh, was saying, uh, we are uh, involved in Eurofunk and in, in specifically in BOFREC, which is a consortium to annotate the functional genome of, of the code. And there we are actually in, uh, using NFCore uh, pipelines for doing some of the, of the analysis. Also other uh, consortiums, the one that is dedicated to the, to the genome of the, of the pig and the chicken and the one that it's dedicated to, to fish uh, are using NFCore pipelines. And this is interesting because when we started using them, uh, NFCore was mainly DSL-1. But as pipelines are now becoming DSL2, I think that uh, and DSL2, what well, it's it's interesting because DSL2 is how you can now reuse code. So uh, what we want we're planning we're planning to do is that in case we need any additional uh, implementation, anything that it was not uh, in NF Core, what we will do is that we will implement this uh, part of the pipeline of the NFCore pipeline, but this in DSL2 was complicated. But now, for instance, uh, already with the rna seq pipeline, we wanted to use a string, a string tie to, to annotate the genome, and we created a, a sub workflow for this. And it was quite easy to just create the sub workflow and plug it in NFCore rna seq pipeline and, and make, it, make it work. So I think that DSL2, it's, it's very interesting. And you will see how, how I, I didn't put any line of code and so on, because Luca will show you how to do this during the course, so I, there is no need to, to do this. And another thing that uh, I wanted to, to discuss to end up with is Nextflow Tower. So Nextflow Tower it's, has been created by Sequera Labs. Sequera Labs is the, the company that Paolo and, and Evan have created, and it's behind Nextflow right now. And Nextflow Tower is a web user interface uh, that allows you to, in, to interact with Nextflow. It also has an EPA that allows you to, let's say, talk to pipelines in, <laughs> in plain terms. And also another interesting thing that you can do uh, in Nextflow Tower, so uh, in this web user interface, is to configure crowd environments. And it's much more easy, for instance, I have been playing with uh, Amazon, and it's much easier to do it using Tower than <laughs> using the, the native Amazon staff. And also enables to run pipelines in the cloud or HPC and then uh, monitor them. So this is as an example. Also, this will be shown by, by Luca. So there is no need to, to show you many details. Yes, that you get a, a glance of how it works. So here uh, you have all you, the runs that you have done uh, using, an, an F, uh, using Tower, sorry. Uh, the one that it's running right now, which is this one, and the ones that are, have been run in the past. And also you can get uh, some real-time statistics. So here you see that there have been five submitted process, eight have succeed. So here you have um, some of the processes that have succeed, and there is more, more stuff. So this is just a, a small uh, screenshot, but there is much more information. And yes, uh, I think that uh, I will turn up with this. Here I just put some 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 links in case uh, you want to to take a, a look on any of the things that they have discussed during the presentation. And yes, and if you have any questions, just just go ahead. <laughs>